I should say um, I'm very grateful to the organizers of this forum to give space for this, to this topic, which is, um, in my mind, uh, very important, for, should be more important to all of us, but it's not getting too much attention often in uh, major events. Also, the IMU, I think, is doing a good job in uh, uh, getting this topic uh, advanced. So um, why am I here? Um, I'm obviously not from a developing country, at least if you count Germany as a more developed country. Um, so, but I had a share in two projects that uh, played a role in the development of mathematics in Ecuador, and this is, uh, was all related to Hermann. And so we are presenting together um, how uh, we had maybe a small impact on the development of mathematics in this small country in South America, unfortunately, we didn't put it on the map, so I hope you all know where Ecuador is uh, on the west coast of South America and pretty much in the north, south of Colombia, and that plays a very important role in what uh, we'll talk about. So um, this is a little bit of the uh, overview. Um, I will speak about the first two points very briefly, and then Hermann will speak about a um, quite interesting project that we've done. <clears throat> so, mathematics in Ecuador doesn't have a very long history. The first mathematics department was founded in 1975 at the Escuela Politécnica Nacional in Quito. And um, there was a little structure in the research in mathematics, even until 2003, when uh, we got involved there. Uh, there was little scientific output on the level of uh, journal publications. There were few international collaborations until then. I think mostly, if you talk about Europe, for instance, mostly with France, there was a little bit, and uh, a few of the people in the department got a PhD in France, but there were only few, I think it, at that time only four of the people in the department had a PhD. Uh, nobody ever got a PhD in mathematics in Ecuador at that time. Um, and there was also little support from government and from industry. So um, up to 2003, in the mathematics, in this only mathematics program in Ecuador, in Quito, 150 people graduated. And towards the end of that phase, there were, as far as I learned, two more mathematics departments um, established at other universities, but with little output at that time. And I should say that if we talk about mathematics, in particular if we talk about applied mathematics, was statistics, and this had a big share of mathematics at all. And there was no, well, very little numerical analysis, there was hardly any optimization, so I'm talking from the perspective of an applied mathematician working in these areas. So the person, the general perception studying math, to study mathematics in Ecuador was that you would waste your time and that you would risk your future. And this is, I think, what Hermann heard quite a bit when he decided um, to study mathematics. So um, this was the situation when um, Martin Krötzl from the TU Berlin, uh, former secretary of the IMU, had a PhD student from Ecuador, Luis Miguel Torres, and they during a trip to uh, Ecuador, they had the idea that it was, would be something very helpful to have a structured PhD program in Ecuador and to really um, start a program at the end of which uh, people should earn their PhD degrees in Ecuador. So this was the idea. Um, this idea was supported then by TU Berlin and by the German Academic Exchange service, the DAAD. Altogether, for the first two, four years, there was a promise of spending 300,000 euros, which at the end were not spent. Um, there were some grants for the lecturers and for the students it, that would enroll. Um, the student, we as lecturers, would go to Quito and teach for two weeks a compact course. And the first course given in that program happened to be given by Volker Mehrmann, who is now the chair of the Matheon in Berlin, and myself. And as the students, eight of which were enrolled at the beginning of the program, uh, decided on their supervisors on the spot, Hermann, why, why I don't know, chose me, myself as uh, his forthcoming supervisor. So this is how it started. 
Uh, over the years, um, I myself, from my grants, I was a lecturer at TU Berlin in 2002-2003, then I uh, had the first professor position in Chemnitz. In 2003, I skipped in some grants, and also uh, Volker and Martin Krötschel and many other people in Berlin helped to support the students to stay longer, to come more often, and so on. So we, we added a little bit to this, uh, what the DAAD and the TU Berlin gave initially. Situation for the students wasn't easy. Um, many dropped out at the very beginning because the salary, which should have been $800 at the beginning, was at the end uh, turned down or decreased to only 400, which they even had to tax then. Um, and um, it was hard to survive, in particular in Quito, on this. So many people who already had a family, they could not, could not live on it. So they just left the program. Also, the prior education there wasn't on the level um, of nowadays. So it was hard for them to get on the level where international research would start so they could enter their PhD, the, the topic of their PhD. So some of them decided that it's not doable for them. Um, eventually, we got success, and uh, as the first person who graduated with a PhD in Ecuador in mathematics, uh, it turned out it was Hermann in 2007. It was a very nice um, defense of his PhD thesis. I think it lasted five hours or so. We really made sure that he deserved the first PhD. <laughs> <laughs> The president of the university was a member of the, um, of the thesis committee. He also was um, instrumental in setting up that program. He had a mechanical engineering degree from TU Berlin, so he was uh, really helpful in getting this going. So um, by 2011, eight students from that program graduated, and uh, now I think uh, a little bit of mathematics, applied mathematics in particular, was established, but there was no continuation of the program at that point. So the question now arose, how will this go on? How will this development be continued? And this uh, will be continued by Hermann now. Thank you, Peter. Um, so first of all, let me thank for having the opportunity to be here. For me, it's a great honor to be here, especially to have the chance to talk to, for, to such distinguished audience. So um, I'm going to talk here about the, the first uh, funded project ever in Ecuador. So uh, it turns out actually that in 2006 um, the government decided to, to have a call for research projects, but uh, it did not really work out and at the end the project that were selected did not really get the fund. And in 2008 they have another round. So. Um, it was really hard to convince the, the, the government to get some money, so we have to figure out something uh, really that the government is interested in. So we came with the idea to, to, have the, um, to propose a project about a, a political um, situation that we were living back then, and it's related with this uh, glyphosate uh, sprays. So what is glyphosate? So glyphosate is a herbicide used by the Colombian government to spread coca fields um, in, in Colombia and also close to the Ecuadorian border. So the sprays took place essentially um, starting in 2000 when this so-called Plan Colombia started. And uh, well, there, there have been many studies that, about this ne negative impact in agriculture and health. So in 2005, the governments decide to sign an agreement to stop the sprays in a corridor of 10 kilometers along the border. So, however, Colombia was under, under, under suspect to not to respect the agreement, and this ended up in a trial in the International Court of Justice. So, gladly, the, the trial ends in 2013, and well, in this context, um, in 2008, we proposed to make a simulation of the glyphosate area, aerial spray drift in Ecuador-Colombia border. So we got the project, we got a big grant, we spent it well, as you will see, and what we were offering in a sense, it was like um, to propose a model for the, for, the, for the drift and to perform some numerical simulations 
and together with some other research groups that actually were studying some genetical changes in human beings and animals in some areas, uh, particularly in the Amazon region, uh, to evaluate whether if the agreement was uh, respected or not. And the problem, the problem was that actually um, glyphosate have a lifetime uh, really short, so it's in a period of, of, of weeks. So every, the, the spray already stopped in 2006, and in 2009 and on, it was kind of our job to evaluate if the agreement was respected or not. So this was a joint project, and it was funded by the uh, Quadrillion Science Foundation, the Senacit logo there, you can see it over there, and the Escuela Politecnica Nacional, and also the group in mathematics and industry and technology that was led by, by Peter Benner in Chemnitz. Okay, so that's what we wanted to do, but um, here are the difficulties we have to face. So um, most, there is many models in the literature that can handle this, uh, the, that can model quite accurately, actually, the drift of the aerial sprays. But the thing is, like, most of the models rec require at least this information about the, uh, this information. So you need information about the aircraft, the speed, flight conditions, you need information about the nozzles, you need also information uh, to know the drop size distributions, uh, the spray material properties, and also ambient, ambient uh, meteorology. So what was happening in the, in the sensitive zones is like the, the first three, the first three here, they were not really available yeah, as an input, and actually the fourth is difficult to, to estimate because the areas in which this is taking place actually is taken by, by the guerrilla. So there is no meteorologic um, centers there. Okay, and probably the most difficult thing on, on handling the project was uh, to handle it administra administrative. I would say I have a very interesting um, a statistic that I made. So it turns out that there was no really procedure for, for how to handle the project. It was the, the first one ever in the country, so no one really know uh, how to do it, and no one really want to take responsibility on that. So um, although we have some budget for that, we were not able to, to hire some administrative staff to, to carry it, so I had to do everything by myself. And it turns out that in 2010, for instance, I had to write like almost three letters per day concerning the project and tracking them and really going and talk to everyone related. So it was the same procedure for buying uh, toner supplies or, or printer supplies that if you really are going to buy the computer cluster. So it was, was really, really, really difficult to handle. Nevertheless, there, was, there were also some other things to take into account, and that was the um, a specific procedure uh, that the sprays were taking place in the border. So here there are some um, international aerial spray guidelines. So the idea is that you always will use the uh, largest droplet size to avoid the drift. And um, you are supposed to, to spray only if, if the wind is not that strong. So particularly, you know when you, you are allowed to, to, to spray, so you have the, the bones, like between one and four meters per second. And you should avoid spraying in, in low humidity and high, high temperature conditions. And probably what affects the most is the height in which this aircraft is, is performing the sprays. So the, the maximum height is 25 meters. So what is happening in the sprays at, at the border was that the droplet size was not according to standards. So it was, according to Colombian government, at least three times bigger. And the height was uh, way too big, so something between 40 and uh, 80 meters, and that was essentially for the topography. And in, in practice, uh, in most of the, the zones, this ambient meteorologically ex easily exceeds, ex exceeds the limits. So that was the situation, and that, that actually uh, justified that we are proposing a, a new model, because, as I said, this phenomenon is widely studied since the 70s. And there is some software that can predict it quite well if these um, international guidelines are fulfilled, but they were not. Okay, 
So let me go further. Here there is a picture of the sensitive zones. So to give you an idea, we are talking about uh, domains about like um, eight kilometers times 10. So this is El Conejo, San Marcelino, and um, Changane. And this is located in the Amazon region. And uh, I was picturing there some, some average width. So in the bottom is Ecuadorian territory, and up is Colombian territory. OK, so I will not really go through the details of the project. I will just show you some, some little simulation that we made. So this is the simulation in a, a two kilometers and two kilometers domain. So we end up having a large scale problem. And here, what we can see in the, in the video is we have a simulation of how the, the aircraft pass, and we have plot the, contra, the, the concentration. So we can see that over, over time, we, we can have less concentration, um, less concentration in the domain. So that was, uh, this is just a two kilometers and two kilometers domain, but actually, that's exactly how this, the simulation looks in these real domains. And um, we perform 2D simulations and also 3D simulations of that. And we got um, quite good results, actually. Maybe I will just talk about the achievements, what we got. Uh, as I said, the case was settled in, in actually September last year. And Colombia agreed to pay $50 million to Ecuador. And uh, we also set up a, a supercomputing center at the Department of Mathematics at Escuela Politécnica Nacional, where that was most of the grant. And moreover, I think that we somehow convinced the government to invest in research. So nowadays, um, the government decided to invest in the, in the so-called MODEMAT, which is a center of mathematical model, uh, which is uh, working quite well at the university. So, in general, since, since 2003, scientific production has increased. Uh, now we have um, a workshop on optimization that is taking place every two years. And it, it holds the first time in Ecuador. And now it's, it's going all around South America. So this year was, was in Peru. And um, the Society of, 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 of Mathematics in Ecuador was refunded. And actually, in June 2014, we were uh, admitted as a, officially as a member in, from the IMU. So these are some, somehow the, the results. So in a sense, the government now is in, investing more. Actually, the government have a very ambitious project. Maybe you have heard about it. It's called Yachay. That's a Kichwa word. And um, it's, um, they are trying to build a city of knowledge, as they call it. So they, they want to invest like. $35 billion to, to have a, a high standard, a, a top university. And this is on the way. And um, that's what I, I wanted to, to tell you. And I think that, I think that we really help, we really help to, to achieve this in a dire way. So if someone is interested, um, there are some references. We just. Um, uh, published some snapshots for this overfolk in this imaginary, so you can find it online. The, we have also some printouts that we just get it if someone is, is interested. Another article, uh, it will also appear in this Max Planck Research Magazine in the first number of 2014. And well, besides that, we have write, uh, we, we wrote two papers and we published a book that appeared also this year. So I will stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you.